It's no reason to become alarmed, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your flight. By the way, is there anyone on board who knows how to fly a plane? And it was you, <laughs> woman, <laughs> oh, no. right down the line. Just got that out of my head. I do <laughs> not sing. I cannot sing. <laughs> but I'm going to keep that in your head the rest oh, of the day. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Avoiding Real Estate Turbulence Podcast. This is your pilot, John Lafferty, with Century 21 Town & Country. And Tony Abate with Ross Mortgage, and we are your real estate pilots. Our job is to be your real estate advocate and also make sure you're educated about buying and selling process. We'll keep you informed throughout until we get you safely closed. In a real estate transaction, there are many reasons why you can encounter turbulence. Today, we're going to talk with Tony Bucci with Mission Point Planning and Retirement about financial turbulence and how that may have an impact on your decision to whether to sell your real estate or buy. Welcome, Tony. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me back again. I appreciate being in the jump seat. Good to see you, Tony. Good to see you back in the jump seat. Uh, Before we get underway... Tony has a disclaimer he has to read, so we'll get that out of the way right now and then dive in and have some fun. You guys can appreciate being in a highly regulated industry, and I am as well. So before we get started, uh, it's it's important to know that securities offered through Securities America, Inc., member FINRA, SIPC, advisory services offered through Securities America Advisors, Inc., Mission Point Planning and Retirement, and Securities America are separate entities. Now that's right. now that riveting part of the conversation is done with. I feel like I was just in a coding class in Detroit. What the I hell think I was that just mean? Miranda Miranda eyed by a by a financial guy. You know, Miranda eyes is that the word? It could be. It could be. <laughs> so Tony, um, something happened a few weeks back. There was a business round table, and they came out with this proclamation. I guess you could say, you could call it. Basically saying that, hey, um, we uh, we need to consider not only the shareholder in the decisions that we make going forward, but also our employees, our customers, and our clients. And that was a bit of a shift from how things have been for quite a while. Mm-hmm. And so I, I thought it was interesting enough that I said, hey, we got to get Tony back in here to talk about mm-hmm. this because uh, it, there seems to be a bit of a shift. And why is that? Why is this happening? Uh, it seems to be out of the blue, but it really isn't, is it? No, I don't think so. Um, and I guess as it relates to turbulence, um, this could be considered turbulence in the, uh, I guess, the stock market. You know, if you, if uh, CEOs of companies are now more focused on other things and not maximizing shareholder value, uh, at first blush, it can look like that. Uh, that somehow, as an investor, you might not want to be a part of a company that isn't maximizing shareholder value. Um, but when you kind of peel back the onion, um, there's a couple different perspectives on this. Um, one which is completely cynical, and that's. Uh, um, that this is just window dressing, uh, <laughs> given the uh, and that this is a this is something done by CEOs and their publicists to to make the companies look more attractive, and then the optimist is that this is this is great, this is real change, this is and this is change that's been really driven by um, uh, by a lot of factors, but really mainly by you know, the folks here in the United States demanding more out of their their companies. Um, people are not willing to work. Um, just for a paycheck anymore, and uh, you know I hate to typecast entire generations, but millennials are a very big part of that. The studies show that it's their they need something more, um, and I think a lot of folks want something more out of their work. Um, but it's you know the business roundtable, which is a nonprofit organization um, comprised mainly of CEOs. Um, I think this is just more of a reflective of the business reality, in that in order to be profitable. Um, you need to, I mean, it seems basic and common sense, but you need to respect your employees. You need to respect your customers. And through that, you'll actually make money and therefore inc- increase shareholder value. Um, so the question is, is it new? Is it not? Um, I, I have a couple feelings on that. We can discuss that further, but I think it's more of just the cost of doing business in, in today's world. And I think in the in the long run, if you have happy employees and happy customers, you're going to make money. And if you're a shareholder of a company that's making money, you're making money. I was going to say, you know, yeah. maybe maybe I am in that optimistic group, but in those additional elements that are added in, they do circle back to adding shareholder value. Yeah, absolutely. Ideally. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I'm 100%. And it's... Uh, um, and I, I think it's also, I think it's an it's, it's important departure um, from the previous doctrine of just maximizing shareholder value 
in and of that, it's it has a inherently it's a more of a long term view of the corporate of of a corporation. Mm-hmm. Um, as may, some of your listeners may know, maybe some don't. Uh, publicly traded corporations <laughs> have to re, um, they have to uh, share quarterly earnings and quarterly reports. And a lot of times the stock prices will move and jump based on earnings season. Um, if you watch CNBC like I do, earnings season is like, uh, it's to say it's, it's a big deal for them. And so the question really remains, I guess, if you're a shareholder, do you want a, a company that makes short-term decisions in order to maximize the, the quarterly earnings? Or do you want them making decisions, although maybe painful in the short run, are best for the long-term view of the company? And, that, and I guess that really, from a from an investor standpoint, and John and I were talking about this earlier, it was it really depends on how you view your investment. If you, you know, we're in we're in the Detroit area. If you're a, if you own GM stock and you're in it for the long haul, you want to see GM viable for the next five mm-hmm. to ten years. But if you're a short term trader, if you're to use a real estate term, if you're flipping your stock, you know, you're buying just for a few, you know, just for six months to a year, you don't really care. You want them to maximize that shareholder value in the in the, in the short run. And that really goes to the rub. It, you know, this is good or bad news also based on how you view your investment. Mm. No different than if you were flipping a real estate you know, a home or whether you were a long-term investor and you had tenants. You may or may not know the answer to this, but I'm just curious. Was publishing quarterly reports always, was it, has it always been this way where the, a company issues a quarterly report on earnings or at some point did that just become the norm? Uh, it wasn't always like that. Um, if I had my trusty Google in front of me, I could tell you the year it changed, but it wasn't always the norm. And actually, it's been there's been discussions lately, when I say lately, really in the last year or so, about whether or not that needs to continue to happen and whether maybe releasing earnings every two mo- every twice a year maybe or every six months would be better. Uh, the flip side of that is um, if you are... Uh, if you're more of a corporate watchdog, you don't want to hear that because you want them reporting earnings more regularly. When I say corporate watchdog, if you inherently distrust a corporation, which a lot of folks do, you want to see that you want to see those books all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess it just really depends on whether a company is willing to, um, you know, have a bad quarter for a, for a long term for long term gain. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't see it changing anytime soon, to be honest with you. But there has been some discussion. That's interesting. Okay. So the logic of having quarterly earnings reports is so you can kind of keep an eye on a company and make sure they're not going astray. And if they are, you can correct it Yep. Uh, as opposed to doing once a year, annual, or every six months. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the, the key thing is publicly traded company. There are companies that have that have not gone public for this reason alone. They don't want to have the... Mm-hmm. Um, they do not want to have the the push, the responsibility to have to always every three months release earnings, release numbers, and have to deal with Wall Street um, consensus. Um, because there, you know, this is maybe a little outside of the this uh, this particular topic, but there are um, abilities to manipulate publicly traded companies. I mean, there's this is big in the '80s with corporate raiders. I mean, yeah. there's a whole, you know. Richard Gere's like character and like Pretty Woman was a corporate raider, <laughs> yeah. so you Michael could tell with some Wall Street. Yeah, mm-hmm. you, it is good. Yeah, you, ex- exactly. Yeah, so you could take you know if you got a consortium of investors and you got you you uh, Carl Icahn is I think is a big guy in this. Yeah. Uh, you know, you get fifteen or twenty percent of a company's stock, you can move that company. Um, so there's there's some incentive for companies to <clears throat> not want to be public or return to uh, private. Um, yeah. So mm-hmm. it's uh, there's there's two sides of the coin here. There's the coin the side of that that uh, there is the as an investor you want to know, but then if you're the owner of the company, you m- you might not want to have that responsibility. Yeah. You know, it's uh, it's it, I mean it's definitely interesting, but I think more than more than anything, it reflects just really the changing dynamic of our society, and it, you know it certainly reflects. I mean you see it in real estate, or you see it. I mean you guys might see it in, in your own personal companies, or um, in that. Like I said, it's the companies n- realize that nowadays, in order to be profitable and to re- actually return shareholder value, and as an investor, you know, a return on your own investment, the company has to be lo- has to be viable for a longer period of time, and that involves getting good quality employees, and actually having people that want to 
buy your product. There's this, I mean, the, um, I hate this, like the very, one of the very first times this has happened, we, we call this, there's actually a whole brand of investing called ESG or environmental, social, and governance investing. Let's go back, like, let's go back to the eighties. There was a time that this country, thankfully boycotted South African com- companies during apartheid. That was one of the very first examples of social, um, social upheaval um, relate, spilling over to the business world. That's an extreme example, but it's, this is not new. Yeah. It's just becoming more mainstream now. You know, there, there's, there's a logical segue because I think a lot of the things that you're talking about in the investing world are, are happening on the real estate side. Yeah. You know, it really is. Uh, the way people hold homes, uh, the type of corporations that are getting into real estate, uh, it, it's, it's an interesting parallel. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's almost like a cultural thing that businesses overall are, are changing. Um, and we're, we're definitely seeing it on the real estate side yeah. for sure. Yeah, a lot of a lot of venture capital money is in real estate now, and in these uh, uh, <clears throat> fintech companies, yeah. other technological companies, you have these um, these startups who are creating. Uh, well, they call them i buyer programs. Mm-hmm. Okay, and so the theory behind them is, what we're going to do is we're going to take the normal real estate people out of the transaction. Mister Seller, you and I are going to work together directly. We're going to come into your home. We're going to do a, a walk around. We're going to look at comparables. We're going to make you an offer. If you accept our offer, we're going to pay you this amount of money. We sign a contract, and you're going to pay us a percentage, typically anywhere between 6 and 12%. We're not going to involve a realtor, but we're going to give you your number. We're going to do an inspection on the property, and if there's things we find wrong, we're going to renegotiate. And as long as you're okay with that, We'll give you your money in about two weeks, and you move out after the process, after a 6 to 12% fee that you pay us. And then what we do is we plug money, and this I'm speaking of the iBuyer program, not me, we. Um, they then plug in some money into the house, whatever it needs, a new carpet, paint, whatever, and then they turn around and flip it and sell it. And in theory, it sounds like, wow, what a... What a convenience for sellers. What a great idea. Hmm. But, of course, the flip side of that is they're not paying market value. They're gonna, no. The only way this works, the only way this program works is if they buy low, sell high, make enough money on the fees in between to cover it, and they're still operating at a very razor-thin margin. They're not making a ton of money, which is why these programs, if there's anything that upsets the apple cart, let's say – a recession where house values start to drop. If there's anything like that, these companies all fail. Hmm. The, they start losing big money. And, you know, at some point, as, as we've seen in, in other industries, venture capitalists are willing to invest money, invest money if they see a return eventually coming. But something like this, operating on razor thin margins, it's not sustainable. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, interestingly enough, I read an article. Um, one of the political candidates, um, who's who's running for president, released their one of their programs. Did you read this? No. <laughs> so, uh, oh, yeah, I did, but go ahead. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. one of the things that this candidate is proposing is a vacancy or a flipping tax. So, if if you buy a home and flip it and never have lived in it. I think the I think there's a 25 percent fee on that, and if you own a home and it's vacant, there's a two percent fee on that. So you take either of those fees. I think it was 25 percent. At anyways, first blush, why would you want to disincentivize somebody to improve <clears throat> right. a piece of property? Mm-hmm. I, I don't understand that. Right, right. Yeah. The the in, the incentive from their perspective is. Well, we're trying to encourage home ownership. We want we want owner occupants. We don't want investors buying up neighborhoods and, and areas. That's their theory. is is we're gonna we're gonna solve the housing <laughs> crisis by making homes affordable again. And this is how we're gonna do it. We're gonna disincentivize investors from buying big blocks of homes and putting tenants in there. They destabilize neighborhoods. Hmm. That's the theory. 
Anyways. So they'll go back to being vacant for years and years and years yeah. is what's going to end up happening. So. So what, what, didn't we just get over these zombie yeah. uh, foreclosures? Mm-hmm. I mean, there's like any, like any, um, I, I, I'll, 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 I'll play devil's advocate and say, you know, I'm sure there's good intentions behind that somewhere. Um, but like any good intention, there's some unforeseen consequences. Mm-hmm. And so, yes, I, I get, I, I understand maybe, um, rem- like if you have a big investor, say it's a, I, I've heard, I don't know this, you guys would know more Black about Rock? this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or, yeah. Over like big institutions. I get that. But from a, from a financial advisor's perspective, um, you know, we, I don't, I don't, I don't advise specifically on this, but it's very common. I've seen a lot of our clients who are retired own rental properties and and still get into this because they were very handy. And what you're basically doing is you are going to really disincentivize the small mom and pop flippers. And these are people. These there's these are big income. And what they're Mm doing, and it's going to hurt another part of the uh, of the economy. And the other thing too is, I'll speak personally. I'm not the handiest of guys. I don't want to. I don't. I honestly. I guess I'm going to really hurt my man card here, but um, <laughs> I'm sure I could learn, but I don't have the time necessarily. So when I um, when I was purchasing my home, I was looking for a house that was hypothetically already flipped. Like I wanted to be able to move into the house. Mm-hmm. And so I, the converse was I could have bought that house. I would have had to hire a contractor a const- and then have to, have to manage it myself. And uh, I'm sorry, that's not necessarily at that particular point something I wanted to do with and running the business. So... Um, that's interesting that that's, uh, you know, first blush, it's not something I, I, I think that is, um, necessarily a, a great thing, but, um, I'm sure there's, there could be some other reasons behind it. That's more of a citizen view as opposed to a financial <clears throat> advisor's view, I guess. Yeah. Uh, you know what? And, and, and Tony, I'd be interested to hear your yeah. opinion on this, but from an econ 101 standpoint, the residential real estate market as it operates right now is really driven by a, a healthy bucket of natural forces, mm-hmm. supply and demand, um, you know, all the right things come into play. And my fear is, is that when you start poking at the bear, if you will, hey, we're going to put taxes where we never put taxes before, uh, we're going to have an iBuyer platform that's, that has got a completely different goal than a real estate agent's platform, um, you can really start to upset the apple cart in a really unhealthy way. We, we've seen that in the past, and, and I'd be interested to hear your take on this, but you know, you think back in the 70s when they tried to just put arbitrary price ceilings in effect. It yeah. just didn't work. Yeah. Inflation went rampant and things got crazy. So I'm very, very nervous about, the, uh, about being on the cusp of things tied to real estate that are, that are a complete departure from the norm with, with this picture that it's going to be great, but Past history says y- you got to kind of be careful with with shaking up nature. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I I have to admit I'm not as familiar with the iBuyer program, mm-hmm. but the description you guys just provide um, just There's different di- different different versions different of it. Different versions of it. Um, I, I would say it, it scares me to know that just that somebody would pay a six to twelve percent premium just for convenience. Mm-hmm. Um, we see this a little bit in the financial advising world, where um, some of the big companies are. Are you know one of my biggest bugaboos is hey roll over your money in seconds and I'm thinking, well why would you make a a, a financial decision on your 401k which is supposed to be the bastion of your retirement your future mm-hmm. based off of convenience and I get it people are busy but I I, I but you always pay a premium for that convenience regarding um, upsetting the apple cart with some tax legislation um, and not letting market forces work especially in the real estate yeah I mean I don't. I, I, I sometimes think that sometimes we're solving problems that don't exist. And, uh, well put. And, uh, yeah. you know, part of, and this kind of goes <clears throat> back to, you know, relating to this, you know, this um, corporate government's change. You know, market forces will work. I mean, the, these, com- I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to you, but the CEOs are responding to what the public is demanding, not what the government is demanding. And so, you know, they're, they're and so I think it would be better. Um, if there is an issue with flipping that people, that there is a companies coming in and making a, a, a tons of money and pulling it out of the community and not bettering the society, I think there might be a better way. But I, I don't see that. I, I, I think I think you are going to really hurt the the local business owner. And I mm-hmm. I have a few of these folks that are real estate and developers, and they're not they're not they're not corporations and publicly traded companies. They have kids in their schools and. Um, I think I th- hope I'm, I'm hitting the point here, but uh, um, you know, is disruption natural? 
within any industry? Absolutely. We we have disruption in, in financial advising. You guys are going to have you had it in heck in mortgages after two thousand eight. Mm-hmm. Disruption happened due to um, due to mar- you know due to due the due due to the reality of the economic crisis. But that's because it's. That that wasn't a made up crisis. There were issues, right. and so the question is: is like, once again, are we fixing problems that don't exist? Mm-hmm. And I guess I did, had had I not known about the flipping thing or the um, or the extra tax, and you know, honestly, I think there's bigger fish to fry. Uh, there's yeah. and there's more organic mm-hmm. ways, yeah. I think, to possibly address this. And mm-hmm. and uh, there's a couple communities out there. I think Minneapolis, St. Paul is one mm-hmm. of them, where. And one could argue maybe they went a little too aggressive, but their idea was. We're going to create higher density areas. Mm-hmm. So on these lots that are larger than normal, we're going to we're going to create duplexes or triplexes where possible, so that two or three families yeah. can move in there, or one family can move in one unit and rent out the other for potential income. So we have higher density in certain areas, and that might help offset some of that, as well as may help offset price appreciation year over year. So I understand it and that's that's a I think that's a more appropriate way to possibly address that. Now of course you've always got to fight the people who live in certain communities because I don't want I don't want these triplexes down yeah. the street from me. I don't want three families living out of one home. This is not not in my neighborhood or not in my backyard. Is uh, the saying goes. I live in one of those communities <clears throat> right now. Uh, not my backyard. Oh yeah, they're yeah. angry about all the mansionization of, okay. uh, of your your community. People are angry about that. Yeah. Now certainly, but I mean that guy kind of goes back to the the solution. It, it should be shouldn't it be more of a local solution? You know, the, the local community kind of decides or works mm-hmm. within local government to discuss zoning and, and things like that, as opposed to uh, kind of I feel like I'm a this is a political talk here, but like so, <laughs> states' rights versus federal government. Anyhow, history. My history teacher would be pre, would be proud that I remember that stuff. Uh, but anyhow, yeah. I mean, it's uh, yeah, it's 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 uh, I, I don't know. It's yeah. it's certainly one of those things that like like I said, I think uh, going back to like legislation and and taxes to address issues. I mean, I think it has to be broad enough and it has to be a problem that's pervasive enough to. To matter. If not, it should market forces should market or the public should kind of demand change. Um, their local government. Yep, absolutely. Or, yeah. So that, and that's typically where we see it. Yeah. Well, yeah, if I could, let me yeah. paint a picture because I'm, I'm, I feel strongly about this and I've, I'm feeling more strongly about it as time goes on uh, about, you know, this I buyer impact as it relates to the current real estate community. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, I'll be brief because it, it, it touches really more on what you do, John. But so, so let's look at a conventional situation. So John, professional real estate agent, he goes to list a person's home. And what is his agenda? His his goal, his fiduciary responsibility is to get as much money as possible for that home seller. Mm-hmm. So he markets appropriately. Uh, he advises in negotiations and so on so that if there's, if there's a high water mark that he can obtain for that seller, that is what he has set out to do. And in doing so, the seller wins, the community wins, mm-hmm. future sellers win because now that sale is a comp for the next guy. Yep. All the right dominoes seem to fall. Now comes the i fi um, um, i buyers. I'm sorry. So <clears throat> I'm, I'll, I'll put it out there. So you have the Zillows, the Redfins, Open Door. Um, who am I missing? There's a there's a couple others. But but yeah. you know their their goal is to is to provide that shareholder value. Yeah. And so how does that work for them? It works for them by buying that home at the lowest possible price yeah. to appease that shareholder, and then and then sell it at a later date for a larger spread and for higher than typical fees. Yeah. And uh, really, they're at cross purposes to what has worked for years and years and years. And uh, I, I, I really, I'm, I'm troubled as to how sustainable that really is. Um, I, it, <laughs> I think it, 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 to interject <clears throat> just briefly, it's, it, for us, it's, it's actually illegal. So they have something called front running. Mm-hmm. So I cannot, so front running essentially is if I, Let's say I advise you to buy Facebook stock Mm -hmm. because it's a great deal because Facebook stock dropped. If I make a trade in my own personal account before I make a trade in your account, I'm actually doing something that's illegal. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because what I'm doing is I'm putting myself in front of you. I'm getting a better... Now, is my little trade going to move Facebook to stock? No. But the point is I'm basically... I'm I'm putting myself uh, in a more advantageous position at your your expense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And... In a roundabout way, and the iBuyer program you described, yeah, I mean, as a 
as a home seller, I don't, I don't want the individual to, I don't want the individual buying my, or representing me to sell my house, mm -hmm. to be able to be incentivized to actually make a profit on the house. I want them to give me that profit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I yeah, yeah. totally agree with you. You bring up a, a really good point, and, uh, and and it's it's one of the discussions that I continue to have with people who who see this as a benefit. In 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 fact, you and I were talking about this uh, because what they're doing in order to make this work is they're rolling in. Hey, if we come and buy your home, you're going to use our escrow company to do the closing mm -hmm. and everything, and they're, we're going to charge you the closing costs. And hey, by the way, um, we need to do an owner's title search for you, so you're going to use our title company and pay them to do the title search and issue a commitment for title insurance. And hey, by the way, um, we're going to do this and this and this, and you're going to use our company, and we're going to make this work for you. And by the way, are you going to be buying a home after we sell this to you? Hey, we've got a lending company. What do you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. So. So it, it, they roll all these things in, and now, now you have a viable company. You've got all these services rolled into one, and you would think that having all these things would be a respa red flag. Yeah. But these guys, these 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 iBuyer programs, these companies are seem to be uh, occupying this gray area where. Nobody seems to know what to do with them yet. And mm -hmm. they'll eventually figure it out once people start getting screwed over mm -hmm. by these companies. Yeah, I sold my house, and uh, gosh, they turned around and sold it for $80,000 more. Plus, they charged me 12%. The title yeah. fee was two grand. My closing costs were a grand, and this and this. Yeah. And I just found out I got taken to the cleaners. Yeah. It, and it, it ain't going to be short long term. It, it happens in the short term. Absolutely. So here you are. You've sold your home. Mm -hmm. It was a quick sale. So it was convenient. And it's like, you know what? I got my money. I didn't have to uh, put up with a lot of hassle. But wow, three months down the line, my prior home is now on the market for tens of thousands of dollars more. Mm -hmm. Uh, for and and you know the, the, in their own websites they'll say we are not flippers. So you're not talking about a home that is going to look dramatically different on the resale. They're doing some cosmetic repairs. They're doing mm -hmm. some some stuff that was was super highlighted when they purchased the property to to drive that price down to the seller. And then you know, boy, looks like my very same home is up for sale for fifty thousand dollars more now. What happened? You know. I'm just gonna say something. Back in the day, back in uh, you know 08, 9, 10, 11, when you had people buying these homes and flipping them, you had these contractors, right, or people who had money and were buying these homes and flipping them, and they would make these improvements: updated electrical, updated plumbing, um, new drywall. And one of the things you never knew was. Is this guy a psychopath who bought this home and did this <laughs> stuff in here? Or did he actually know what the hell he was doing? Yeah. I have no idea. Did he pull permits to do any of this crap? No. It's a nice house. Yeah. Do we take a chance? I guess we do if we're going to buy the house. So you had people buying these homes in 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and three, four, five, six years later, all of a sudden, Things start going wrong with the house. What's the, and they're having to replace things and and do different things. And so, you know, these companies are no different than any other company that wants to make money and mm -hmm. maximize profit. Are they going to trim corners when they need to fix something in the electrical or or do something with the plumbing? Hey, the main line seems to have a lot of tree roots in it and there appears to be a crack. Well, let's just do the easiest thing we can and the cheapest one, and we're not going to pull permits to do anything we're going to do. Um, I, I, I just I see it as an all-around problem. Where's the accountability yeah. well, for the buyer who buys this home, right? So... If exactly so, if you're buying a home, you're not bu like so you're not buying it from the individual. You're buying it from the company. You're buying it from right. the company, okay. right? Right. Well, and, and you know what? Yeah. I, I'm sorry, and you're ahead. paying a fee for buying that home too. Yeah. By the way, there's a there's a fee on the back end. Hmm. Yeah, it, the, the fees rack up in a way that are that are almost egregious. I would okay. say, and I would argue that this is going to impact <clears throat> the the. the the home buyers that can least afford that sort of a thing. Yeah. So if you're a first time home buyer or you're a modest price home buyer, what what do you probably not have? You probably don't have a lot of extra cash to do fix ups yeah. uh, in that home. So your investment in that closing represents probably the majority of your saving. And so now you found that diamond in the rough, you know, you found that really nice home where all the other ones in that price range mm -hmm. are, are somewhat distressed. And you're relying on the fact that the person that made those improvements did it all right 
state did it perfect because you can't afford to do it again. So I would say arguably this type of practice could have a, 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 an impact on the low to moderate home buyer that could have difficulty recovering from that kind of thing. It just, again, I, I feel like we're, we're putting artificial things uh, in a, in a, in a, in a yeah. financial process that was working fine by using natural dynamics. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, as an outside observer, but financial, you know, someone who deals into finances quite often, it, it, it seems to me it's like the real estate version of the payday loan. I, I well, for put, convenience yeah. for convenience I'm willing yeah, I'm willing to pay a, a percentage analogy. for that and you know and for some as you know payday loans exist because people need them and there's nothing wrong with that especially in the short term cash crunch there's always a fee and it yeah. sounds like um, going back to our discussion about the uh, the proposed tax on flipping I, I guess I can see if it was a company like this that maybe that's that would be a good thing um, I know we're kind of talking about two different things but um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, as I said, as a, a financial advisor, but also as a homeowner, you know, I, 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 it would be very difficult for me to believe that this was in my best interest. Yeah. Let's take it one step further. Okay. Um, you know, it's bad enough when it's isolated in one transaction that impacts the seller, but that's not how it works in real estate, right? I mean, mm-hmm. the whole essence of appraising property is based on what other properties have sold for. Mm-hmm. So now as the as the percentage of sales of I buy transactions go up, so will the percentage of homes that have sold at a lower than market value. So the sale of home A through an I buy transaction becomes the comp for the sale of home B. And now that number is lower because of that. I'm, I'm, I'm really concerned about how that's going to trickle through. So what's, what's the, since we're talking about market forces and consumers, what's driving I buy? Just convenience or other other I factors? I think it's convenience, and I also think it's being falsely marketed as a cheaper way to sell your mm-hmm. home, to okay. get the realtor out of the transaction. Um, and so it's, it's really a false promise. It's... It's a we're gonna we're gonna save you the convenience and the hassle of having people come through your house and you gotta deal with a realtor and pay his fees. We're gonna do it for you much cheaper. We're gonna simplify it and we're gonna get it done in two weeks. If you so if you need your money in two weeks because you're gonna go buy a new construction down the road, mm-hmm. hey, we're here for you. So okay, I, I I can see for instances like that, I can see where something like that may come in handy. But in general. I don't see how it works. So there's there's a local <clears throat> real estate celebrity I hear on the news that guarantees they'll buy your home if they don't sell it. Is that kind of is it work in a very similar manner? I think you know who oh, I'm talking about. Oh, let me explain this <laughs> to you. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> so here's we did not pre plan that. Yeah, no, no and, I just and, I'm in the car a lot. <laughs> yeah, me too. So um, not that I have read this. Uh, person's marketing plan and know exactly how it works. So this is just me taking a little bit of a stab in the dark. I sit down with you. I say, Tony, here's uh, here's my marketing booklet. Here are the comparables for what homes have sold in the area that are similar to yours. Here's where I see your home selling. It's going to sell between, let's just pick an arbitrary number. Tony, I see your home selling between Four hundred and four ten. That's where I see it selling. That's where I see the market value. That's what the comparables say. You say, "Hey, that doesn't sound right." Actually, I think my home. You know, I know my neighbor down the street just sold his house for four thirty five, and my house is nicer than that. That's what we hear from a lot of sellers, by the way, all the time. <laughs> my house is nicer than the guys down the street. Um, but but I, I say. But Tony, this is what the comparables are saying: four hundred to four ten. And you say, "Well, uh, I don't know. I don't know if, if I if I agree with that." Well, Tony, you know I do have a guarantee or a um, let's change that word up. Um, I have a promise that if I don't sell your home in this amount of time, I will buy it from you. So. Tony, I'm willing to I'm willing to list your house at four twenty nine nine and start there, or four thirty five and start there if you think that's where it is. But if we can't sell it there, we need to drop the price to get to the range where I think it'll sell. And you say, oh, okay. 
And I say, and then you say, well, what about your uh, what about your promise to buy my home after a certain amount of time if I don't sell it? Tony, I'm glad you asked. So here's how this is going to work. After the certain amount of time that I say that I'm going to buy your home, um, we said that your home is valued between 400 and 410, right? Mm -hmm. And you, do you agree with that? That that's where I think it's going to sell. That's where the value is. For the sake of this, for the sake of this, yes. Okay, I agree. <laughs> so here's here's what'll happen, Tony. Um, we agreed on a six percent commission, correct? Yes. Okay, so we're looking at about twenty four, twenty five thousand dollars in commission after everything's said and done with fees and everything. Eh, let's let's call it an even thirty thousand. So what I'm willing to do right now, Tony, for my promise is I promise that I will buy your home from you at three sixty five. <laughs> no, no commission, and, and I'll charge you no commission. Three sixty five. No commission. I'll buy it. I'll write you a check, and you can walk away. That sounds like the iBuyer program you guys just described. <laughs> <laughs> wow, what do you know? Hey, yeah. what do you know? <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I understand. And you know, there is this, there's no such thing as a free lunch. And I think when I hear that, I instantly think, okay, what's the catch? Mm -hmm. I just wonder, and just like if I was listening to the iBuyer program, I would wonder what's the catch. But I don't think a lot of not everybody does that. By by clear indication, if somebody's advertising that much on the radio, there's funds to to you know there, there's a reason where they're doing that. Um, that's interesting. That's just another interesting uh, um, change. Or I, mean, I don't know if it's a change. How many other real estate agents do that? But um, certainly an interesting upheaval, we'll say. Um, but it doesn't sound as altruistic as uh, as it looks like. It doesn't seem to be as altruistic as it sounds like. I should say it, it, it's not. But for marketing purposes, it sounds great, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, um, mm -hmm. If if I was to tell you that, and I, hey, if I can't sell your home in this amount of time, I promise I will buy it from you. Yeah. Um, and and it opens doors. Yeah. It it makes the phone ring. Um, but the reality is is gotcha. something different. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. I think the economic comparison too is, uh, you know, trading in your car versus selling it on your own. Yeah. Everybody knows that if you sell your car on your own, the likelihood of getting a higher price is is very, very good. Most folks don't because of the inconvenience yeah. and, and so on and so forth and probably not knowing how it works. This is the same kind of thing, but I think the stakes are so much more higher. You know, they're 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 so much so much higher. Yeah. So you're talking about a home, you're you're almost always talking about a six figure transaction. And, and, and really what these iBuy platforms are bringing to the table is, is a time saver. And so I, I would hope that homeowners would, would just kind of hit the pause button for a second and saying, all right, is going from 10 to 14 days versus 50 to 60 days, is it really worth 20, 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars in lost sale proceeds? That, that's really where it kind of seems to distill down to. Is that's, is that's a right. huge amount of, and I guess that's relative, a, a huge amount of loss in, in profit or equity, you know, is really what it is, in exchange for, in my view, a small amount of time savings and, of course, the inconvenience of having people traipse through your home or whatever. For some people, that's probably really important. You know, I need that money now. If you're a murderer like John Wayne Gacy, <laughs> it's probably really important not to have people marching through your house. Very true. Very yeah. true. Yeah. But but yeah. I, I would say that these companies are marketing it as, hey, this is going to be the norm. Everybody's doing it, so get on board. It's technology-based. It's the cool and sexy thing to be doing. You know, you're doing what hundreds of thousands of other people are doing, and it's just not true. But that, I think that's what they're trying to make it sound like. Well, I mean, I, I, I look at, like, there's just a couple things to unpack here, but one of the things, using your analogy uh, of buying, a, or buying a, a car or selling a car on your own, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it, in a traditional real estate transaction, there's, tr there's trust in the buyer so if I'm buying, like I know there's somebody on my side and there's someone on your side. Mm -hmm. So if I'm buying a car, I'm buying from a private seller. I'm not really sure. Therefore, I may want to just buy it from a dealership, and therefore you may want to trade it in. Mm -hmm. So I feel like there's already advocacy there on both sides of the on both sides of the equation. 
Um, but also the other thing I was thinking is just we and John and I were talking about this is just this concept of people don't want to be bothered anymore. Yeah. People don't want to talk to people and people don't want to be bothered. And, you know, we see it um, in the financial planning world when it comes to life insurance. Life insurance is, um, I know we weren't going to hear talk about life insurance, but life insurance ownership, depending on the, on the study you look at, is at an all-time low in the United States. Mm. Well, people, it's because people... Life insurance agents are uh, looked at as one speaking of cars, one step above a used car salesman, and so people I guess don't. It's a matter of your opinion, or yeah. one step below. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, interesting enough. Interesting enough. As opposed to cars, there is no dickering and dealing in life insurance. Whether you go online or you go to an advisor or an insurance agent, the price the prices are set by the insurance company, which is. Uh, but people don't. They don't want to be bothered. And I get it. I come home. I have two little kids. I have another one on the way. And the last thing I want to do is make decisions. But at some point as a financial advisor, I'm saying, okay, you have to take the time out to make the best economical decision for your family. And that may involve allotting some time to tackle this. We have we we spend pl- plenty of time planning vacations. And I mean, I, I'll speak to my generation. I'm a man in, in his 40s, and I spend plenty of time researching my fantasy football draft. <laughs> I can certainly spend a little bit of time um, doing other things. And I understand I'm, I'm, I'm not a disinterested third party because I'm in this world, but you guys are professionals. You deal with people. And um, and you probably, you know, Tony, you see it in the mortgage business with the mm-hmm. digit, um, the rocket mortgage. Now you can get a mortgage in two seconds. Sure. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing, um, that, that product or that platform, but convenience as a method as an attraction tool to make a big financial decision is something that like i would like to see kind of curbed a little bit yeah. and the only way it's going to curb be curbed unfortunately is enough people get burned by something and uh, if enough people get burned by the i buyer then they won't do it mm-hmm. and i hope that's not the case i hope that's not how we have to learn about this stuff um, because i you know i th- hope that i buyer companies are are taking their um, taking a cue from you know the, the business roundtable, they're looking at their customers and saying, okay, it's not just for our, our shareholders, mm-hmm. but if those iBuyer programs, here's another level, if those iBuyer programs are being funded by, by private equity, that it's not going to happen. Sure, they're going to all all they all all because the private equity, their number one job is to get their money out with a profit. Mm-hmm. So I know we're dancing around a bunch of subjects here, but as you guys talk, it just makes me think about some of the, the, the this trend in inconvenience versus accuracy of a financial decision. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Can we, um, <clears throat> you and I talked before about, um, basically we were, we were talking about different analogies and how the investor and how they don't want to invest in certain companies unless they're doing certain things correctly. Mm-hmm. And um, there seems to be a push toward uh, disinvesting in funds and maybe portfolio type things that have um, gun manufacturers in it or yeah. environmental companies that that, that are, are coal companies, for instance, who don't want to invest in that anymore. And and you you gave the analogy of, um, it, not a direct analogy, but you kind of use the analogy that as real estate goes, you have um, you have these companies that are like slumlords. They own these these buildings that are dilapidated and aren't up to code, and and they don't want to put any money into it because the the tenants that are living there are paying a small amount of rent. Mm-hmm. Um, but you you. You take them and you, you you look at another landlord who's got a nice place and people are happy to live there and people are happy to pay there, and so they're happy to give their money to the landlord versus this slumlord. And I, and I almost see a little bit of a, a parallel between people who are willing to invest in certain types of things that are doing well mm-hmm. for for society and for things as a whole and and – and the same thing over here. And so I, I'm just curious in your take, do you, do you see that this is the way moving forward? And do you see an overall effect on everything with this attitude, uh, you know, starting with maybe investing in stocks and companies and things and just sort of being pervasive throughout uh, society as a whole? Yeah, no. Um, so what we were talking about, um, also was real estate investing, 
we use the word slumlord. The word slumlord instantly conjures up negativity. And I think when you own real estate, I think it's a much more visceral experience. Mm-hmm. You, you own a piece. Of, and that's what a lot of people love that aspect of it. I want something that I know is real and tangible versus owning a stock, which technically is just as real and tangible. You are now part owner of a company. And, um, and when it comes to this, this new governance, when it comes to, um, to investing in stocks, essentially your question is, are you, would you, would you, if you are investing in a, a company called ABC Automotive and ABC Automotive treated their employees like, you know what, um, they, um, they had a plant in, um, we'll say in Brazil that like polluted the Amazon rainforest that killed wide swaths of it. Uh, of of land, is it really any different than being a slumlord? It, it's probably really it shouldn't be. Um, now here's the thing: Do you really care? So it really depends. If you're if you're an investor, um, if you of course if you're an investor, do you just want your return? And most people say, hey, this is for my retirement. Given the fact that uh, we talk about this all the time, how today's the a- average Joes are investors now. I mean, the, with the the deproliferation of, of pensions, they're not here anymore. With Social Security, um, be, uh, with concerns about Social Security, more and more people invest money. And at the end of the day, if you need an, a certain rate of return, um, does it does it matter to you? Well, some people will never will, and that's and, th- and, th- and that's fine. I mean, financial advisors we get judged based on our rate of return. Um, it's a question we ask our clients: Are there is there are there any investments that we have to stay away out of? Um, uh, personal philosophical reasons. Heck, when I started in the early 2000s, it was standard question to ask a Ford employee if you wanted to screen against GM stock. <laughs> I hate to say it like that. It was the case. <laughs> wow. Or, heaven forbid, you know, international automotive companies. Yeah. Um, but but it, it's also leading to, now it's, the convert is, I think people are waking up to this. They want, they want, from an investing perspective, they don't, not everybody wants to be, um, to own things that, that conflict with their values. This type of investing actually is called, it started as what's called SRI investing, a socially responsible investing. And really, and that's been around for, and I, I mentioned the, the one ex, uh, example of, uh, of, of, the, of, of apartheid earlier, but really that's an example of socially active investing. It has now morphed into something called ESG investment for environmental, societal, or governance investing. Um, so there's a whole list of mutual funds, investments that you can pick that reflect your values. Um, uh, down to and, and and the converse too. There are funds that invest completely opposite. There's a fund called Vice. It's, uh, it's Vice is what it is. It, they invest in uh, <laughs> munitions, arms, tobacco, wow. gaming. Um, so there's a belief that you know those are those companies generally are profitable. Uh, the technical analysis of that kind of stuff is that yeah, alcohol is generally what we call a could be someone known as a defensive stock, meaning defensive as in that defense industry, but tends to do okay even when the economy's bad. Um, so, but either way, there's a lot of different in- options for investors to choose nowadays, and we'll see. You know, we're with the we'll see where they will will we'll, we'll vote with their feet. Um, I would I would say some I, most of our clients, it's not something that's on their radar, but I think it's there. We're starting to talk about it now. And, um, um, and I think it's because people want their money to say something about themselves. And I think going back to this, going back to this, um, round table, I think the younger generation is, uh, the, the thirties, the forties, maybe in the fifties are starting to really take, you know, to think about that. Mm -hmm. Going back to the slumlord, no, no different than if you had a real estate investor and you offered them, Hey, you can own this eight, you know, uh, eight, you know, eight unit apartment building, you're going to be a slumlord, or you can buy this condo in this nice and residential real estate area. I'm sure they're going to take that because they, they, they don't want to be known. So we'll, we'll see, but it's certainly something good to watch moving forward. It's, it's going to be interesting to see what happens in real estate coming down the line. Uh, you know, you've mentioned that people now own stocks on average about eight months yeah. before they trade and or sell. And we've definitely seen in the real estate and yeah. lending industry that people are buying homes. And it used to be, um, let's say the the what's that generation called? The Notch Baby generation, oh, born one. in the twenties and thirties okay. or the thirties. Um, not the greatest generation; they're in between. So you had that generation that bought homes and typically stayed in them for thirty years, mm-hmm. forty years, fifty years plus. And then you have the boomers, where that was less. And and so now you have 
our generation that, you know, you bought a starter and then you move up to the family home and you, and this is where you're going to raise the kids and they're going to go to school. And then you've got the generations after ours, the millennials and then the Gen Zers who are probably typically going to stay in a home two or three years and move, yeah. two or three years and move. Mm. And, um, and so I, I don't know if real estate's ever going to get to a point where it's, it's more transactional than emotional, mm -hmm. but um, – one could argue that we're sort of heading in that direction for the younger, for the younger kids. Yeah, I mean, I think some of that. I, I, I'm interested in your opinion, but um, you guys were um, in a previous podcast that I was listening in on. You're talking about um, California real estate and negative amortization loans, and it was based on the premise that real estate always went up. <laughs> and so, <clears throat> speaking of the concept of real estate always went up, I think the mobility is tied to real estate always going up. We saw mobility get really restricted. 2008 when people all of a sudden became underwater and now they're just maybe not just but the last few years are with with a price appreciation now people that were in their home are able to move and that's almost creating kind of a i don't know if that removed the log jam or or no it's still a log jam still a log jam john's mm -hmm. shaking his head right now <laughs> uh or it could be just something or it could be something more like hey yeah people um just the concept of of home is different yeah and you know, that's a whole other podcast on the discussion of neighborhoods and people talking to their neighbors instead of texting them and all that kind of jazz. But not to sound like the angry old guy here. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's something to that, though, yeah. you know, because in, in, in past decades, just the event of moving, that was an epic thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it just didn't happen very often. It usually happened because of some, some, some reason behind it. And it was a big deal. Uh, now it's just... We're moving because it's time to move. We're, yeah. We've we've kind of worn out our welcome in this home. We got out of what we want, and now we're just gonna we're gonna move ahead. I, I think there has been societal changes. That, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, in, in the stock world, we know for a fact that it's we're definitely more temperamental. Um, just, so this there is some a study done, or not study, but st stats that show average stock ownership is. I think I mentioned it early in the podcast, but eight months used to be eight years. <sighs> That's um, amazing. And so, kind of going back to this whole environmental, social, and governance, does it really matter if people are only holding this stock for six, seven months? Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that homes are different than stock ownership. So yeah, you're not going to be moving every six to seven months. I mean, personally, moving is definitely one of those things that is traumatic for, I mean, I'm sure most people are, but mm -hmm. remains to be seen. It's interesting. Um, I, I don't know that buying and selling a house will ever get to a shorter period as that. And I think that even at two years, you're pushing it with mm -hmm. the costs involved to move. Uh, it, it almost doesn't seem worth it yeah. uh, at that point. Um, you know, you, you brought up, um, I just can't get that damn episode of Leave It to Beaver out of my head, <laughs> where Wally and Beaver decide that they're going to invest their money <laughs> um, their dad, their dad, and um, Mr. Cleaver invested their money in a utility stock. Yeah, and it was a consistent performing stock over a number of years, but it was only going up incrementally, mm -hmm. very incrementally. And so they read a tip in the newspaper about this hot tech stock back in the late fifties. I forget it was a rocket, yeah. rocket dying <laughs> stock or something like that. <laughs> so they requested that Mr. Cleaver take their money out of the utility stock and invest it in this stock. And he was resistant and resistant and they kept pestering him. And finally he said, okay. And he invested their money in the stock. And then of course, fast forward a week later, there's a news report that the company didn't get the government contract and now it goes belly up. So now they think that they lost all their money, and of course they didn't because they were inv their dad never took the money out of the utility <laughs> stock. Slow and steady. So I, I, I'm reminded of yeah. you know the with the idea of the the long term investment that you sit on it and and you just let it perform over time as the market ebbs and flows over that period of time. To now we want instant gratification and instant return. Yeah, I mean it's. Stud they've done studies that show, I mean, it, people, they, they, they track investor performance and the only variable in these, um, in the study groups was how often people receive their statements. And so they had a group and I, I'm, I'm going off of memory here, so I can't cite it exactly, but they had a, a, a group that got their statements every six months, every quarter, every month, every week. And, um, you would wow. believe it or not. Of course, the more frequent they got the, their, got reminded of their return, both either positive or negative, the worse they did. 
And mm, I think yeah. of real estate, like you, I mean, I know what kind of my house is valued, but I don't track it on a monthly basis. And I certainly don't react because there's some, of course, ingrained reasons you don't want to move. But uh, yeah, I mean, there is, um, you know, I always tell, I mean, I, I, it's just the old Kenny Rogers song, no one to hold them when no one to fold them. And for the most part, you should hold them when it comes to investing. But um, just like, you know, just like real estate and mortgages, financial advising, you know, we, we, we deal with headline risk. Headline, you know, the news is pervasive, Twitter, Facebook, social media. And so it's constantly bombarding you with worry. And so worry, we know worry drives, worry and fear drives decision making much more than greed, believe it or not, wow. even though Gordon Gecko said greed is good. <laughs> and so that's why the people that get their statements quarterly, or sorry, quarterly did better than ones that got it monthly. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, um, you know, I think Warren Buffett said something about like, you know, you know so he alludes to the fact that he got so rich because it took so long to do so <laughs> and that most people are not willing to get rich slowly. Um, use the Leave it the Beaver episode. So, um, you know, I guess it just depends on what your money's for. That's one of the things we always tell as a financial advisor, what's the, what's this money for? Mm -hmm. You know, is it, um, if it's play around money and something you like to like take a chance with, great. But if it's, you know, if it's your house, you know, if it's your mortgage, you know, and I'm not investing, these are just decisions, I say, you know, then um, prudence is usually better and patience is usually better than um, than reacting to market or reacting to some hot stock. Yeah. You know, an interesting parallel, yeah. and I know we gotta, we got to be thinking about wrapping up, but yeah. uh, it, it struck me when you were talking about how the people who receive their statements frequently tended to underperform. And, and you mentioned something about your own home. I really don't know what it's worth. And, and that goes for all of us. And in times past, we didn't know what it was worth unless we called somebody like John and they did some in-depth analysis. What do we have now? We've got Zestimate that tells yeah. us instantly. So is the same thing going to happen? Are, are people going to make poorer decisions because they've got that data right in front of them that they're seeing every day if they want? And of course, we could have a different conversation on the validity could, of his estimate, right? But <laughs> could, couldn't you? But, I mean, well, if my estimate is higher than what I think it is, then it's true, right? Well, <laughs> good point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but can't, think about it. Yeah, yeah, they've got that data right in front of them. Mm -hmm. You can envision somebody saying their house is in June here, and then in July it's up here, and they say. Honey, pack the bags. Yes. We gotta sell mm -hmm. now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get that sign in the yard. Or if they had not known. Yeah. The similarity being not receiving the statement, they would just let s slow and steady win the race. But because they saw it, is that going to affect a certain number of homeowners? Who's I, to I, say? I absolutely think it will. I mean, yeah. there's a, we, we don't have the time for this, this is maybe another podcast, but there's a psychological bias called anchoring. Um, anchoring is where we kind of mark to a price internally. Mm -hmm. um, and so famous example is when Ford went to 25 a share back in the, like the early 2000s, talked to a Ford employee when it was at three a share, oh, to get back to 25, because that's what they remember it. <laughs> yeah. And so if you see that Zestimate and it, it says your house is worth X, Y, Z, you're not going to forget that, assuming wow. and it's going to be difficult. And as a, as a real estate agent, you know, you're trying to accurately price the home um, and you're, you're, you, there's something to be aware of that they're, if they, if they've looked at Zillow, they, or Zestimate, is that either way, the Zestimate from Zillow, they may be stuck on that price. Um, personally, I can tell you that uh, firsthand I was stuck on a price yeah. with Zillow. So <laughs> think, think <laughs> about the influence. Think yeah. about the influence. You know, in your world, nobody would be able to put data out there that would influence a price, yeah. right? But in real estate, Zillow does it every day. I, they, they can put yeah. any number on that Zestimate that they want, really. Huh. And you and They're I talked about this. The market. We, yeah. He and I talked about this a couple months ago. And I said, isn't it going to be interesting that you have a company who puts uh, an estimate of what your home is worth and at the same time, they're in that local market yeah. purchasing homes from sellers and flipping them. Do you see a conflict of interest oh, there gosh. down the road? Yeah. 100%. Mm. Let's just put 15% lower market values out on Zestimate six months before we go into that market. Hey, Phoenix, we're coming in. Yeah. Guns loaded, yeah. ready to go. Not that we're biased, but we're a little biased. Before we yeah. go, though, <laughs> I, I wanted to, you know, you, we were, we've been talking about, um, you know, you, the average investor was eight years, now it's eight months, and things are changing in real estate, and, and people are buying um, and shorter, selling in shorter, shorter amounts of time. And so talk a little bit about why having a, a knowledgeable financial advisor to help somebody with that mindset 
by providing them a, a, a strategy and, and an education and, and advice and how that plays a vital role in, in helping them make correct decisions. Yeah, it's financial at the, at the heart. Financial planning is making is using an expert to give you wisdom and judgment on a decision that they feel is best for you or that together you feel is best for you. We do this all the time. We you you ask for relationship advice. Your best friend knows you better than you do. And so there's a certain level of judgment with a financial advisor in your guys feel there's a certain level of technical expertise that comes along with that. But ultimately there are I mean there's in financial advising and investment management, it's a world of gray. It, it, it's not, it's not, exi- this is not tax and not accounting. It's not one and one equals two. It, it, it's trying to determine and clarify your goals, your objectives, which is an important part of the puzzle. Most, most individuals come in wanting to invest money. We, we step them back to discuss goals and objectives because mm-hmm. any, dis- the, the merits of a decision, um, really, it's only, it's really good or bad if it brings you closer or farther to your goals. If it brings you closer, it's a good decision. Farther, bad decision. And so, um, in order, you know, in, in the real estate business um, or transaction, um, if somebody wants to buy a house, something often like, we'll, we'll take a look, okay, if you buy this house, what are the ramifications on your other goals? And then you prioritize and you make your decision. Um, and then, of course, yeah, you know, then we promise the ex. No, I'm just kidding. We're not going to promise returns, but um, and then we, yeah, then we try to grow your. Then we, of course, grow your money to to achieve your longer term goals. But ultimately, it's organizing your decision and, get, and arming you with, hopefully, the peace of mind to make the decision that's best for you. Yeah, yeah, I like it. Mm-hmm. Very good. Good discussion today. All right. Well. We definitely want to thank Tony Bucci with Mission Point Planning and Retirement for stopping by. Hey, Tony, if, if people want to reach out to you, get in touch with you, contact you, how do they go about doing that? And who should be contacting you? Who, who are you looking for right now? Uh, well, I, I appreciate that. Uh, the, the simple answer is we're, we're, uh, we're just located in Troy. We're, we're a boutique wealth management company. Um, our home off, or sorry, our broker dealer, our, our back office is Securities America. Um, you can be reach us in one of two ways. Uh, direct line into my office. I still answer the phone, believe it or not. 248-504-6015. Our website at mission, uh, www.missionpointplan.com. Um, we, we're, we're really big on transparency. So you get to know basically everything about our firm, including our personal lives. We, our family, my interest, even my favorite food to eat is on there. Um, partly because we think financial advice is very personable and you have to really trust and know the person you're getting it from. Um, so like, you know, we are, we like to think of our clients as family. My particular uh, specialty within the practice is really for those folks that are, uh, retirement is, you know, they're in the seventh inning on their way to retirement. And so it could be 50 plus, but we really, my, I really do a great job in, in helping to organize decisions to shepherd somebody into retirement and then develop a plan so that they don't outlive their money. Um, we have other, asp- other advisors in the firm that specialize in, in millennials, um, physicians, Gen Xers. Um, but it, I would say the reality is if you're unsure about your, the future when it comes to your finances and you're not sure about big financial decisions, doesn't have to be us. I think it's, you know having a good financial advisor in your life that um, that you trust and that you can confide in is is probably crucial just for just about everybody. Um, but it, but if it's us and you like to learn more about us, those are the two ways to contact us. Great, that's great. All right, Tone. Always a pleasure having you on. Thanks, thanks, thanks guys. Thanks. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you for listening to Avoiding Real Estate Turbulence podcast. Uh, if you'd be so kind as to subscribe, review, rate us, we would appreciate it. Please share with your friends and family, coworkers, that they too can find us. The website's not up yet. <laughs> Damn it, I gotta change the website. It. Verbiage. Uh, the website coming. soon. <laughs> the website coming soon is avoidingret.com. We'll, soon we'll have each podcast episode on that page that you can listen to directly from there. That's coming soon. Don't go there yet, but it's coming soon. In the meantime, you can find us on Google Podcast, Apple Podcast, and Spotify. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. And I still don't understand the verbiage from what he said earlier about his disclaimer. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs>